Hello everyone and welcome to the Game Engine programming series where we write a game engine from scratch. Previously we managed to successfully load a scene and light it using directional lights. We even have a few game scripts running that animate some of the objects in the scene. The next step would be to work on other types of lights such as point lights and spotlights. However we need some way of inspecting the results and debugging the visual artifacts which is rather hard if we only look at the scene from a single viewpoint. So I decided to spend one episode on writing a basic input system which we can use for camera movement using mouse and keyboard. Today we'll set up the basic functionality of this input system and in the next two videos we'll use it to add camera movement and also expand it to be more practical for game development. Before creating a system that handles user input, let's have a look at a few input devices. There are of course thousands of different types of input devices, but the majority of them can be categorized in such a way that covers most cases. For example, have a look at this exotic device, which is a board with keys on it, and although I haven't yet entirely figured out how to use it, I know that all these keys have just two discrete states, which is either pressed or unpressed. Therefore, we can already define an input category for discrete input with a value that's either 1 for pressed or 0 for not pressed. Here is another device that looks like a flagellum, but is called a mouse for some reason. It's got a few buttons that can have a pressed or released state similar to a keyboard. In addition, the position of the mouse is a free range input that can have any value, and therefore it's another category of input. Turning the mouse wheel can also result in any value, but in general we are only interested in direction in which the user turned the wheel and how fast they did it. Next we have a PlayStation controller, which has both discrete and free range inputs. However, it also has continuous input buttons. These are buttons that can have a continuous range between 0 and 1, where 1 means fully pressed and 0 means fully released. Any value in between means that the button is not fully pressed, but also not fully released. The thumbsticks and trigger buttons belong to this category. Paying more attention to the difference between a thumbstick and a trigger button, we can see that trigger buttons don't have a direction and therefore only have a single scalar value between 0 and 1. However, the thumbsticks have two directions towards which they can be pushed. So they actually have two values in x and y direction that can be between 0 and 1. We can even think of input devices that have three axes for their input. For example, the Wii and Switch controller's position are in three dimensions. To account for this variety of input axes, we'll return input values using a 3D floating point vector. We want to expose some of the functions and data structures of the input module to the game code, so I'll create a new header file in the engine API folder and call it input.h. Let's start by adding an enumeration for access. In the current state of our universe, we only have three, which we call x, y, and z. For keyboards, we can define flags that can indicate whether one or more modifier keys have been pressed. These are the Shift, Control and Alt keys for which we have a left and right key on most keyboards. As I just explained, we return the input value in 3D vectors. We put the previous and current values of each input in this structure and return it. 
Next, we need to define a code for each and every input value. This will be a collection that contains all input codes for all devices supported by the engine. Obviously, we are not going to support all devices in existence right now from the beginning, but we can already add the mouse and keyboard keys, and for that, we can look at the ones defined in the Windows header file. Here we see that each key has a value that would fit in a single byte. So I'll just put these next to each other and add a code for each key. We are not going to support all keys that are defined by Windows, because some of these only occur on special keyboards, whereas we just want to support the keys on a standard IBM keyboard. Let's start with input codes for the mouse. The mouse can change its position, and we can even distinguish between each direction of movement. We also have left, right, and middle mouse buttons, and mouse wheel. We can continue this list with keyboard codes. I'm also going to fast forward through this, because it's just me typing over the key names. Note that we do have extra entries for modifier keys, which are handled differently in Windows input. I'm going to add them in roughly the same order as in the Windows header file, but they can be in any order since we are going to map them later in the platform-specific part of input module. Next, we have keys like backspace, page up, page down, and so on, followed by numbers and letter keys. Finally, we have the numeric keypad. And that's pretty much all of them. Later, we can expand this list with input codes for any other input devices that you'd like to support, such as console game controllers. Now we need a data structure that defines an input in a unique way by combining the input code, input device, and other properties. We call this an input source. It has an enumeration for device type, such as mouse and keyboard, controllers, and maybe even raw input devices. We can use this struct for input binding, so I'll add a binding field here. We'll discuss input bindings in the next two videos, so subscribe and press the bell button to get notified when those videos come out. We continue with the source type and the input code. I think I'll use an unsigned integer for this instead of using input code as a type to make it possible to listen for any input code, even the ones that are not listed in our enumeration. Next is a multiplier which can be used to set a direction for the input axis among other things. For example, using A and D keys for moving left or right, we can set the multiplier to minus 1 for moving left and plus 1 for moving right. As explained earlier, we can indicate if this is a discrete input source or a continuous one. The source axis will take the corresponding input from the source and map it to the axis field. We can also set some constraints using the modifier keys. We could add a lot more properties to this, like the acceleration and deceleration or stickiness of the input, but this is good enough for starters. One way of getting input values is by asking the system for the input state every frame. This is called polling. Another way of getting input is by waiting for the system to notify us when there was a change in the input. This is the event-driven input handling. We'll support both methods in Primal Engine. We can poll for input values by calling the get function for any input source type and input code. Implementing this function will provide us with polling capability. For event-driven input handling, we need to set up a system that we can add in any game script that handles input events. We start with the base class that's not supposed to be used directly in the game script. Therefore, we put it in the detail namespace. It has a pure visual function called onEvent, which is called by the system whenever an input event occurs. It has protected constructor and destructor functions that attach and detach the input system. Let's start with input polling the implementation of which is part of the engine code. Therefore, I'll create a new folder and put another input header file in there. This one is private to the engine and is not accessible by game code. Unsurprisingly, we also need a function to set the input values whenever they change. 
I will add the CPP file for the implementation. Here I'll use an unordered map that contains input values. The key to each input value is a 64-bit unsigned integer which we construct by combining the input type and input code into one integer value. I'll write a function that creates the key given the type and the input code. It simply puts the type in the most significant half and the input code in the least significant half of the integer. I'll write the set function first. Here we generate the key from the input type and input code and use it to get a reference to the input value in the unordered map. Note that if the map doesn't contain an item with this key, it will create one. Then we copy the current value into previous value and assign the new value to the current value. While we are here, we can also call on event function for each input system whenever a new input value is set. So imagine we have an array of pointers to instances of input system class, which we can call back. Then we can simply go through this array and call the onEvent function for each pointer. In the future, we might be running our game scripts on a different thread than the one on which this code is running. Because calling on event function could call something in the script class, we are faced with a possible race condition, which we should be aware of. But that's a problem for future me to solve, so that the present me can happily code away the rest of the input module. Now let's implement the get function, which is really simple actually. It just copies the input value with this key to the location pointed to by the value parameter. We can already implement the constructor and destructor of our base class here. The sole purpose of these functions is to add or remove a pointer to their instance to or from the input callbacks array. Now we are ready to write the platform specific part. Here we get input changes from the operating system and propagate those to the rest of input module. Obviously we are developing for Windows right now, so the platform specific part is only included on Windows platforms. The header file contains a single function that's called whenever we get a window message. This function has the same signature as the window procedure, but we'll only listen for messages that have to do with mouse and keyboard. We'll call this function in the internal window proc in platform bin32.cpp. You could view this as a continuation of the switch statement here that's separated into another function, which we'll implement in input bin32.cpp. But first we need to map Windows virtual key codes to our input code enumeration. So once again I'll open this header file that contains virtual key codes and use an array to map the two values. I'll put the index of each element within this array in the comments. <laughs> 
This way we can easily put each input code in a slot that corresponds to the value of each virtual key code. Where we don't have a code or virtual key code, we put U32 in valid ID. For example, the first element is unused and the second element is mapped to mouse left button, third one to the right mouse button, and so on. Again, we must pay attention that the index of each element is the same as the constant defined by each virtual key. The list continues with the keyboard keys such as backspace and tap. I'll fast forward this part as well since it's just me putting constants in an array. First, I fill the entire array with invalid IDs and also enumerate each item so I can easily put each input code at the index where it maps to Windows virtual key codes. Then I just go through the list again and fill in everything that we have in common with Windows. And that's all for mapping input codes. When handling Windows messages for modifier keys, there is no way of telling whether the left or the right key was pressed. We can, however, call a Win32 function that can give us that information. In order to determine whether the state of the keys was changed since the previous time, we need to have an internal variable that keeps the current state of each modifier key. So we defined flags for each key and we can set or unset each flag when the corresponding key state changes. Now let's implement process input message function. As I mentioned, this is a continuation of the switch statement here, so we can again use a switch to check for input messages. For the keyboard, we have key down and key up messages. We get a mouse move message whenever the mouse position changes, and similar to keyboard keys, we have button down and button up messages for when each of the left, middle, or right mouse buttons are pressed or released. Finally, we receive a mouse wheel message when the user rolls the mouse wheel. For the keyboard messages, the virtual key code is passed through the wparam function parameter. We can use it to map the virtual key code to our input code. If it maps to a valid code, we can set it by calling the input set function. We use the x component to pass the input value. Since keyboard keys are discrete, their input value is either 0 or 1. We also check if the key that was pressed is a modifier key. In that case, we need to determine whether it was the left or the right modifier key. Therefore, I'm going to write a function that handles the state changes of modifier keys. First, we check which modifier key was pressed, and then we call another function that determines if it was the left or the right key. This function calls getKeyState, which is a Win32 API function. We already used it before in our internal window proc, although it doesn't have to be the async function. So let me change that while we are here. In setModifierInput function, we check if the modifier key is currently set. If that's the case, then we call InputSet with a 1 and also set the corresponding flag in modifier key's state variable. If it's not set, we check modifier key's state to see if it was set before and if so, we call InputSet with a 0 and clear the flag. 
Now we can call this function for the left and right modifier keys. Of course, I forgot to actually check for left and right visual keys, so let me fix it real quick. We have Shift, Control, and the Alt key, which is called the menu key in Windows. Okay, now we can continue with the message handler. Handling key up messages is exactly the same, except we now pass a zero to input set function. When we receive a mouse message, the mouse position is contained in L param, and I'm going to write a function that returns the position in a 2D vector. Because mouse position can be negative, we first cast it to a signed integer and then to a floating point value. The x coordinate of mouse position is contained in the lower half, and the y coordinate is in the higher half of L param. They are both 16 bit signed integers, which means that each axis can have a value between minus 32,000 and plus 32,000. When handling mouse move message, we first get the mouse position and then call input set three times once for position x, once for position y, and finally for mouse position. We do this to make it possible to have input bindings that only respond to one movement axis. Also note that we pass the y position in the x component of the input value. This is not a typo. Since we treat the x and y position separately as a scalar value, they are both passed in the x component. When any mouse button is pressed, we capture the mouse, determine which input code we have, get the current position of the mouse and call input set, passing the position as well as a 1 in the Z component to indicate that the button was pressed. The capture is needed in order to keep receiving mouse messages even if the mouse was moved outside the Windows client area. For button up message, we release the capture, get the input code and call input set with mouse position and a zero to indicate button release. For mouse will message, we call input set and we can use a macro to get the will delta from wparam and put it in the x component of the input value. At the end, we return SOK, since we don't really do anything here that could cause an error. This is where I'd like to stop for today. Next time, you're going to write the game script for camera movement that uses this input system. At the same time, we expand the input module with events handling and input binding. As always, thank you so much for joining me today, and I hope to see you next time. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, please feel free to like and subscribe. If you join me on Patreon, you'll get access to the code on GitHub so you don't have to type everything over from the video. Plus there are also other nice goodies and rewards exclusive to my Patreon supporters. Please use the link in the video description to check them out. I hope to see you next time. Until then, take care and happy game engineering.